Good afternoon, everyone here, um, and welcome to the final visual politics seminar for the first semester at, at the University of Queensland in 2018. Thank you again all for coming. I'd also like at the outset to thank the Art Museum, in particular Nikki Garrett, for her great help in making this wonderful space available to us all today. I'm delighted and honoured today to present to you all, or introduce, uh, sorry, to your Associate Professor Sophie Harmon. Sophie is from Queen Mary University of London and is well known for her work on the global politics of health. She has published several books on the topic and numerous articles in a wide range of journals, including Global Governance, International Affairs, EJAR, Political Studies, African Affairs and the Review of African Political Economy. Her recent research and I believe forthcoming book uh, will extend her contribution in this area by examining and utilising film as a method to illuminate marginalised voices and everyday lived experiences across the space of the politics of health. From what I've read, her work is extremely excitable for how it pushes disciplinary boundaries and forces us to rethink what counts as knowledge in politics and international relations. Her exploration and production of film as a research method traverses a wide range of humanities and social science disciplines and I think will speak to many of you here today. Before I hand it over to Sophie, so you know, um, it will be our usual format of 30 minutes presentation and 30 minutes Q&A. So with this, I'm really excited to welcome and introduce Sophie and she'll now speak on making the invisible visible, film production as international relations. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emma, and thank you for inviting me here today. And also thanks to Roland Bleicher and Nikki for setting this all up. Um, this is actually a really special presentation for me. I know everyone always says that when they come and give a talk at university, but I genuinely mean it, because when I started this project that I'm going to speak on, I knew nothing about visual politics. My background was in international political economy, global governance, specialising in global health. So... When I started, I thought, oh, I wonder if anyone's actually doing anything on this. <laughs> Turns out they were, and they were doing it here. And so I read Roland's book, Aesthetic and World Aesthetics and World Politics, and it just had this two really great impact on me. First, it was like a warm hug that I was onto <laughs> something, and I wasn't alone, and someone had really kind of cleared the terrain of saying, this stuff matters. And the second, it also lit a fire in my belly, because I thought, actually... I just thought I was going to make a film as a communication tool, that type of thing. But maybe we could push it slightly more. Maybe this could say something to the discipline of international relations. So that's just to really acknowledge visual politics here at UQ, because I think it's really important what you've been doing over the years, and so it's a real pleasure to be here. So my presentation today is based on some nagging questions that have bothered me for quite a bit in international relations. Questions raised by feminists such as Tickner and Enlo that you are all no doubt familiar with. Where are the women and why is the subject matter of my discipline so distant from women's experiences? So despite these questions being raised over 30 years ago, they were particularly bothering me a few years ago, so about 2014, 2015. I was teaching my class on the global politics of health and as part of that module I show films, um, films on HIV and AIDS. And these films are really important because they have an impact on students. They have that emotional resonance, the kind of Emma's work. You can see that kind of connecting with students. But all these films were very historical. They were about the kind of AIDS epidemic in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And I thought, well, what can I show them that actually represents what HIV and AIDS looks like today? So the sort of thing you see on the left, this was a picture taken in 2012 outside a care and treatment centre in Tanzania. I thought, well, these women aren't coming on film. So what can I do about that? I was also doing the odd bit of consultancy at the World Health Organization, which is actually quite boring, but is a good <laughs> insight to how these institutions work. And at the time, I can remember thinking, well, what are you doing about gender? You know, there's kind of these outbreaks. Is there any, you know, do you ever think about like, the differences? And they're like, oh, that's maternal health, or that's reproductive health. There's nothing more to that. And that was bothering me. And then the tipping point to all of this came during the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. And when I was in Sierra Leone, similarly, I was thinking, well, hang on a second. This epidemic is having differing impacts on men and women. Is anyone measuring that? No one measured this for about four to six months, I can't remember off the top of my head. Which to me was bizarre, because women were overrepresented in care roles. 
you know anything about Ebola, it's highly infectious when a body is uh, dead. So it's who actually cares for those sort of bodies. That's gendered in burial practices. But no one was really paying any attention to this. In that classic idea that during emergencies, everyone forgets about gender as a bit of an afterthought. You know, we have an Ebola outbreak to fight. And this is when I came up with this idea of women being conspicuously invisible. Conspicuous, they're there, they're in care and treatment centres, you know, they're sat around outside these centres, but they're completely invisible in policy. And that kind of combination made me think, OK, how can I make these women visible? And it annoyed me for two real reasons. It annoyed me because I'd spent 10 years working in East African communities, seeing women, and nothing was changing. It's like one of those things you think you've been going on about and no one's really listening. But then I also thought, well, what about feminist IR? Feminist IR has been talking about these debates for over 30 years. There's inroads. You now have lots of feminist panels at ISA, but not in the top of the building, you know, like room like level 48. It's now now on level two. So there's some progress. But really, these same questions are occurring, the where are the women? So I thought to myself, right, let's change this. Let's see what I can do. So I wanted to engage in a method of research which would allow these women to make themselves visible and do so in a way that they could speak for themselves and to get as large an audience as possible. So I was like, okay, how do you get a large audience as possible? I decided to make a film. So to, my talk today is about the use of film as a method and output of research in international relations. And what I think is really important here is how, when I started to make a film, I just thought it was you know, a communication method, I thought it was an output, it's about making the invisible visible. But through the process of doing the film, I realised it also is a method of how we can explore new ideas about the state in Africa, about global governance, and also about transnational feminism. So it is a method of research. So the talk is based on two things. The first is the production of Pili, which is a feature-length drama. This is the poster. It's all very exciting. Um, acted by real people set in their own community in Tanzania. And the book Seeing Politics that I've recently finished about how film helps us see politics and international relations differently. Now that I submitted before I came to Australia last month, so it's under review. So <laughs> who knows if it will see the light of day, but I'm hopeful <laughs> it will. I'm pretty happy with it, so hopefully. So there's still time for me to adjust, if you like, this is fundamentally misconceived, but hopefully that's not the case. So in my talk I'll do the following. I'll make the case for film as method in international relations. I'll explore what stops us seeing film, and I'll ask uh, the question that everyone likes to ask me, well, is it IR? Is it international mm -hmm. relations? Yeah. And then I'll offer some reflections on film as method and output in IR as conclusion. So, before I do so, Pili. What is Pili? Pili seems to dominate my life. People now ask me, how are you? How's your partner? What's happening with Pili? Those are the three <laughs> go-to phrases my friends and family on. So, Pili is an 83-minute feature film co-produced with filmmakers and communities of Miono and Makole in Tanzania. So Miono and Makole are in the Mkwani region of Tanzania, which is just north of the capital Dar es Salaam. It's where lots of politicians come from, so it's lots where kind of health clinics are trialled. Um, and it's somewhere I've been working for over 10 years. The important thing about Pili is it's not a documentary. This is, everyone thinks because I'm an academic I made a documentary, it's not. It's what my friends call, oh, it's a film film. So when my friends have to come and see it, they're like, oh, it's actually a film. Like, yes, it's a film film. Um, the story is based on the lives of the women who act in the film. So uh, there's only one trained actor in the whole cast. Otherwise, the whole cast are drawn from the community. The story is based on the stories of 80 women that Director Leanne, who you can see on the right, and I spoke to. We then took their stories mashed them together into an overarching narrative for the film, tested it with the women, put in some of my kind of research, wrote the screenplay, translated that into Swahili. Most of the women couldn't, speak, um, couldn't read, sorry, so th that was completely useless. So a lot of it was improvised as well. It was a five-week shoot in February to March 2016, all set in real locations. So real homes, real meeting rooms, real beach. This is, I've included this picture of the beach because this is the only inauthentic scene of the whole film. It's the only scene where the women were like, that wouldn't happen, is when she gets to ride on the back of a motorbike. But they all agreed that this would just look really good in the film, so we should keep it. <laughs> um, also functioning care and treatment clinics that we were able to access because of my relationship to the local health professionals. 
Um, Pre-production and production all took place in Tanzania, with post-production happening in the UK. So that's the edit, all that type of thing. Um, for the camera geeks, I don't know, I know nothing about this. I had a great director of photography, but if you're interested in cameras, uh, Pilly was shot on a Canon C300 with 18, 25, 32, 50, 75 and 100 millimetre lenses. Again, that means nothing to me. The lens is the most <laughs> expensive part of the kit because I just went, well, we'll just buy a camera. And everyone went, no, you hire it and you hire all the lenses and everybody guards the lenses with their lives. Um, the film had its premiere at the Dinar British Film Festival last September uh, where the film won two awards. Yay! Wow. Um, and it also had several screenings. So we've done screenings at the UN for World AIDS Day in Geneva. We've also done screenings for Stop AIDS and other film festivals like the Pan African Film Festival in LA and that type of thing. And what's great about film festivals is that what gets you, it's festivals that get you distribution. So Pili will have its UK release, Touchwood, because it never happens until it's happened, um, in the UK in September, and then will be available on DVD and on demand, on planes, the whole caboodle, on December, from December. That's what I'm told, <laughs> but it could all go horribly wrong. Um, it's important here because it's the first time a narrative feature film has been used as a method and output of research in international relations. I haven't found an alternative. No one's ever going, actually, no. So it's a narrative feature film. There's documentaries, there's short films, but no one's made a narrative feature film. It's the first film I have ever made, so this was a real kind of step into the unknown and naivety, Trump's uh, common sense, because um, my role was producer and co-writer of the story. All right? And then we had a professional director, director of photography, camera and sound, so a really kind of their crew in that respect. So the sort of films that we compete with at festivals are indie films of budgets of a million plus, and our budget was £75,000. So that's kind of the levels that we're operating with. As I say, it's a film film. <laughs> okay, so why film? Come to the exciting bit. So, sort of five reasons why I wanted to make a film. And the first one, as I touched to in the introduction, was this picture you see on the left, so 120 beats per minute, which is a film that did really well at Cannes, um, came out in Europe last year. And again, this is a great film. All these films, looking at the history of HIV AIDS, are fantastic. So we were here, How to Survive a Plague. But they really play to the skinny white male aesthetic of the HIV AIDS response. It doesn't really tell you what's happening in the AIDS response since 2000 and the late 1990s. So there's a real, they're historical films. I wanted to challenge this aesthetic. I also wanted to challenge the kind of NGO instrumentalist aesthetic of women living with HIV as well. I wanted to give them agency and voice to show that they're complex characters. So that was the first one, to try and just like challenge this kind of narrative that we have around AIDS in film. The second was I thought that film was a feminist method. I'm just going to say that. Film is a feminist method in that it allows for co-production. So within feminism in IR, there is the whole debate about kind of decolonizing sources of knowledge, how to not appropriate knowledge from research subjects and then kind of rinse it with our knowledge and own it in these kind of ways. So how could you come about a method of research which actually does lead to genuine co-production, drawing on people's strengths of knowledge? And I thought film was really interested in this um, way. It's about visibility and new methods to really advance the field in this respect. I also draw on kind of, so we have Cynthia Webber, the cover of her book there, I Am an American, because it's also drawing on some of the kind of foundations that have already been laid in film and international relations. So Cynthia Webber's work, James Dederian's work, um, Bill Callahan's work, I don't know if any of you have seen his Toilets in China short film, no, it's great. If you're like having lunch today and you want to have a little break, I mean, it's, it just captures that, everyone's fear of dirty toilets around the world. I have a theory that if women could pee standing up easily, they would run the world because it's the fear of toilets. Anyway, sorry, that's completely <laughs> off subject. So it's building on these kind of foundations to look at how we can make film in co-produced kind of ways. The other ways that I wanted to make a film is, does anyone know what this symbol is in the bottom left-hand corner? You know, African map, African film. Okay, so this is the symbol for FESPACO, which is the biggest film festival in Africa. So I see film as also a form of African agency, which draws on some of my earlier work I did with Will Brown. So after independence, so independence from colonial rule, lots of West African states, particularly Burkina Faso and Nigeria and Ghana, really wanted to set up their own film industries. Now, this came with also, for Burkina Faso, heavy investment from France. 
But you saw this kind of emergence of lots of social realist films being made in West Africa that explored nationalism, identity, rewriting narratives, back to the source types of things. So there's a whole legacy of film. Now, most of you, when you think of film in Africa, you probably think of Nollywood, so the Nigerian film industry. Some of you might also be known of the Tanzanian film industry as well, which is um, kind of bongo films, that's what they're called, Swahiliwood bongo films, which are mass-produced, super quick, high drama, fun, like, they're quite bonkers, actually, in a way, <laughs> but they're great. Um, so there's the whole kind of legacy of film in Africa and fil African filmmakers rewriting these kind of narratives. So that's the other way where, reason why I wanted to make a film. So challenge the aesthetic, film as feminist method, film as African agency. The other reason why is this idea of audience. So which audiences do we reach as academics and academic researchers? And that was the really big thing. If you're going to make someone visible, who are you making it visible to? So a couple of weeks ago, I did a workshop with postgraduate students on film as method. And the first question you should always ask if you're going to make a film is, who is your audience? And the reason why I made a drama, not a documentary, I was going to say it again and again, <laughs> is because dramas reach bigger audiences. So the people who watch documentaries are a very specific kind of demographic. Someone who watches a drama is, has much greater appeal. It also has much greater appeal in East Africa. So obviously people in East Africa do watch documentaries. Of course they do. More people watch dramas. So we didn't want to just hit. Now, this is poor Claire. Has anyone heard me mention Claire before? I don't know. Okay, Claire. Claire, who lives in North London, reads The Guardian, sometimes reads The Daily Mail as a guilty pleasure for the showbiz, has two kids, is always targeted by, you know, Oxfam chuggers on the street to give money. She's the sort of person that documentaries target. So if this was a documentary, she's the person they target. I don't, I want Claire to come and see the film. Claire will already come and see the film. But I also want women like my mum, who has no interest in these sorts of things whatsoever, to come and see the film. It's about broadening the audience, communicating and impacting on different audiences. It's also about effect and using aesthetics, the, using the visual combined with obviously sound and music. So that's the thing with film, it's not just pictures, it's a series of pictures but you also have the sound, the music that builds those tensions as well to have resonance on audiences. I want audiences thinking about the film after they've seen it. So if for example I had a friend who was like, I was in a meeting the other day about micro lending and I thought, where have I seen this before? And I remembered I saw it in Pilly. So it's having that kind of long lasting impact final reason why to make a film, and this is what's really important for me about being here today, is what's been really great about visual politics here in UQ is you've established that visual politics matters, the visual matters. We're going to draw on all the realm of human experience to understand the international. If the world is a mess, why are we limiting ourselves? That's great, but then why are we not actually working visually? So what's happened is there's been this established idea that visual politics matters, but we still work with written words. We're not working in the visual form. So I thought, well, this is a new sort of way of built... I don't want to say it's a new wave in the aesthetic turn, because then we're in turns and waves, which I'm, I'm not so sure about. But it's building upon that. to say, OK, if it's important, let's actually work in this. And I think IR has been quite slow to adopt these new methods in ways that, say, anthropology or geography haven't. So... That's why. So then, the question is, if this is all well and good, why is everyone not making films? What stops us seeing? What stops us doing it? And there's four things that I want to talk to you here. The first, I'm going to stand for this because I'm going to actually point to things, is this discomfort in transnational feminism. So it's all very well for me to stand up and say, we'll work together, we'll co-produce, but if you look at a picture like this, this is the sort of picture that... My university loves to put on websites because they're like, look, we have researchers that go and do work with women in Africa. Ta-da! Isn't this great? But some of you might be seeing that and say, I see red flags here. I see, okay, director, producer, that's white lens, two women from Europe going, telling the stories of Tanzanian women. This is particularly problematic. And that's true, it can be. And I wrote a whole article about how this is problematic, which I'm happy to share with you. Um, but it's about sitting in this discomfort. But it does stop people doing this sort of stuff. It's difficult, it's hard, you actually have to confront some really long-term colonial legacies about power imbalances. 
most people would say, well, it's the main difference between you and the women, the fact that, you know, you're British, you're educated, you're much richer than them. Actually, one of the main differences is that I am not married and I don't have children. For the women, that's, they just could not get their head, the, I was working with, they just could not get their head around this. <laughs> they met my partner and they're like, why will he not marry you? I was like, well, I don't really want to marry him. <laughs> but why do you have children? I was like, well, I can't really be bothered. And they're like, what is wrong with you? So, you know, these kind of tensions play out in different ways. So there's a lot of red flags. But I think, actually, the red flags for doing this is a reason why to it, is to inhabit this discomfort and see how you can work with what Manisha Desai calls the dual politics of possibilities. So this shouldn't foreclose. Also, research has got to be tricky. The second thing that stops us from seeing is states. Governments and states do not want people telling stories that they don't want to hear. So this could be the British government not wanting a film like I, Daniel Blake to come out because obviously austerity food banks, you know, it's all fine, everything's great in Britain. It's the same in Tanzania. So having to, making a film in Tanzania is quite tricky. The government, or, well, I'm going to say the state because it was different levels of the state, tried to stop the film from happening in different ways. What's also tricky about this, so this is Magafuli, who came to power in 2015, just at the start of when we were prepping the story for Pili. So this is a picture that I took from the local community of Miona where we're shooting the film. Next to him is the local politician. Now, this was very interesting to me, because that local politician, Juma, had been working for my NGO for 10 years and didn't tell anyone that he was going to get elected <laughs> and that he was still running the past. And he used the NGO to get elected. He said he said, I used it. I, I used my community. I was like, this is great, but you really should have told the trustees about this. But what happened then was a very interesting dynamic because obviously Juma then had a lot of power in the community, so could shut down the shooting at any point. So it was having to navigate these kind of gatekeeping relationships throughout the whole period, which is quite tricky. So what stops us seeing this kind of discomfort, the level of the state, and then I'm very sorry to put up a picture of Harvey Weinstein. <sighs> But also global gatekeeping within the film industry. So the film industry is full of gatekeepers that are either sales agents, festival selectors, distributors. And you would think for a tiny film like this, we would have absolutely nothing to do with Hollywood. But Hollywood is the centre in which film governance operates. It sets the rules. So if you want to get distribution, you have to play the game through these kind of rules and mechanisms. You have to engage with this. Now this is really problematic for a project like Pili, because of course, if you go back to my idea that it's a feminist method, it's African agency, I actually have to engage in those structures that put African film at the margins. And how do you do it in a way that doesn't reproduce those kind of inequalities, which has been really kind of difficult. The final thing that stops us seeing is this, and this is deliberately not in an image, is it IR? Dun, dun, dun. So I have to do the giveaway. So, the first thing is, part of Is It IR is the money to make films. So as I said, so it costs £75,000 to make Pity. That's not that much money when you think about the large research grants that are available. I know a lot of you are working on rejoiners right now, it's that kind of tricky season. But it's not actually the money itself, it's getting the money. So this project was funded by AXA, the big insurance company, bizarrely, um, who have a research fund. And they were like, you're doing something interesting, you've got a good idea, we don't really care what you do, as long as you come out with something great and we believe in you. I didn't have to do quarterly reports, anything. I approached traditional funders about making a film and they were like, no, it's too ambitious, you can't do it. So there's something there. There's also about, well, is it really an accepted method in international relations? Are you doing anthropology? So there's that kind of gatekeeping. So the gatekeeping in international relations for this type of thing is both that well, are women living with HIV in the middle of like rural Tanzania, are they relevant? Well, see, all feminist I are for that. <laughs> then there's the kind of like, okay, the epistemological challenge, does their knowledge really count? Like, is that real? Do they actually have real knowledge? Well, of course, that's, well, we'll come to that in a bit. And then the methodological challenge, okay? It's film is an impact public engagement tool. It's nothing to do with method. So when you think about these kind of challenges, Everyone just says, disciplinarily, we don't know what to do with this. And often when I do this presentation, what's been really great is everyone just kind of sits there and goes, well, I was thinking to myself, is it IR? Then I thought, well, it is IR. Then I thought, practically, well, how do I ever measure it? And that's really depressing, but not surprising. Lots of people are just like, well, how do I reference it? 
How do I measure it? If you're having an appraisal, how does it count? You know, what's, and there are lots of ways in which we can do this, which I'm happy to discuss in the Q&A. But really, is it IR? Yes, it is. Yeah. Surprise! <laughs> um, film, and most notably narrative feature film, is an important and significant method of research and scholarly output in the disciplines of politics and IR. It is a format in which invisible power relations can be seen and in which agents themselves can explore, see and express their own agency, which I think is really important. So with all the women we spoke to, you know, they were saying we work in the fields of, in informal labour. If we can just get out of the fields and have a market store, everything will be fine. And in my head, I was like, well, it's not going to be. But we're like, OK, well, let's explore this. Let's talk about all the different structures that stop you from being able to do this. And let's have a kind of thought experiment. The whole film is in a thought experiment in what they want to achieve in this way. Co-produced film as method and output provides a new and important way of delivering on the feminist project to make the invisible and hidden power relations visible. So that's my kind of first uh, argument. The second is film shows the importance of showing rather than explaining politics. So film can show this shifting dynamics of informal politics and the relationship particularly between structure and agency that sometimes words can but sometimes can't. So everyone knows when you try and explain structure and agency to, say, undergraduate students, sometimes you can do it brilliantly. I'm sure you all can do it brilliantly. But there's that kind of invisible, can't quite grasp. If you can show it in film, if you can act it out, it's a new way of exploring this kind of dynamic. Politics and IR is also fluid, and it's a changing space with multiple dimensions. So film kind of captures this kind of rhythms and the temporality of politics and everyday life that cannot be captured by the written word alone. Now, I am not chucking out the written word, I've just finished a book, so <laughs> I'm not saying that you know, this is saying we should all just work in visual and replace written words. No, not at all. This is just one way in which you, we, we can heighten and explore how we kind of show politics. And also importantly, film production itself offers new insight on transnational relations. So this is the one thing that I didn't realise when I was making the film, actually, is how much it revealed about how I then started to understand and rethink about the state in East Africa. It was going with a kind of film crew which aesthetically infers wealth and that you're going to confront the state in a very unpleasant kind of way. Not that that was ever my intention. But because of that, I was subjected to different forms of interaction and thinking about the state that I hadn't done before after years of being in Tanzania and doing these kind of interviews. I found out new things about the age response, but also about this kind of how knowledge is produced. So really, and also global governance as well. So sort of thinking about the governance of films, again, a kind of whole new insight about how that worked. So it was actually really revealing. As I said at the beginning, I just thought this was going to, also I thought this was going to be a fun project. Film production, not fun. <laughs> as my head of department said, he was like, everyone wants to make a film, Sophie, as if like it's easy and that we all want to do it. It's not easy. It's really unpleasant at times. Um, but we can discuss that in the Q&A. And finally, exploring new methods such as narrative feature film confronts the disciplinary boundaries as to what constitutes method, output, and audience that can, contail, can curtail knowledge and stop us from seeing politics. And I don't think IR is so fragile that we can't expand to explore these kind of new methods. I know, you know there's always those kind of journal discussions about where is IR at X years and you know, is it getting too fragmented with critical theory? Will, I don't think a few people making films is going to lead to the end of IR or what makes us a discipline. I think it'll actually enrich it. So, in conclusion. If we're serious about the need to see women and how their experiences relate to the international, to decolonise sources of knowledge and not speak for the subaltern and innovate in how we use methods and see invisible power relations, then we need new methods and new ways and means of understanding the formal and informal politics. Film as a method and output of research is difficult, unpleasant, risky and imbued with inequality, but so is international relations. Yet, when it comes to methods that we use, I think the discipline of international relations is still quite risk averse. We're not really sure if we're happy with moving these kind of boundaries. So I've offered one way of challenging this. Film is a method of seeing international politics and being seen. Thank you very much.